So welcome back to the second half of this morning session. Um, the first speaker is John Woman from University of Waterloo, and uh, he will talk about reconstructing polyarrow channels. Let's welcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tim, for the introduction, and thank you very much for the organizers as well. I'm enjoying this conference so far, and today, as mentioned, I'm going to tell you about reconstructing Paliera channels. This is a nice timing, actually, for my talk. It just um, fairly soon after Ken Brown's talk, where he was talking about the issue of um, work with Steve Flamier at the University of Sydney, and I don't know why my slides have disappeared, which is kind of funny because here we go. <laughs> Computers never work perfectly, and we are building something a lot more complicated, and so we should expect it to go a lot more wrong. So in particular, ion traps or superconducting qubits have many more moving parts around. Uh, so here in ion trap, you, essentially everything you see in this, in this picture to the naked eye is control electronics. Um, and the current status of the field, of the hardware, is really kind of more akin to the vacuum tube eras rather than the development of the integrated circuit. We're still waiting for the, the revolution that allows us to easily scale. We don't have it. Not yet. So what can go wrong with these computers? Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, maybe we can't communicate our research. The second thing is that we're trying to, to try and apply a unitary transformation to a system. And if you look at how does the system evolve, uh, by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, you essentially have these controllable uh, system Hamiltonian, uh, control Hamiltonians and pulse, pulses, and you can just solve the Schrodinger equation. And you can ask what can go wrong, everything. Um, in particular, so, you know, you can get system Hamiltonian errors. You can get error, the system Hamiltonian is not zero when you'd like it to be. Um, the control pulses that you implement might not be what you want them to be. They typically won't be. Uh, your, con your Hamiltonians have interactions with an environment. Um, oh, sorry, that's more the system Hamiltonian. Your um, control Hamiltonians might have unknown terms that you're driving. And so it can be a little bit of a mess. And the net result is that you get things that if you try and, you know, in, in a logical world, in the abstract com computational model, if I have two unitaries that commute, the order you can do them in doesn't matter. But when you have crosstalk, as an example, or many other experimental imperfections, suddenly the order does matter and quite significantly. So what does that mean? Well, we're here uh, because despite being theorists and talking about theorists of quantum computing, we, we do actually want to see these implemented. We want to see the abstract quantum computational model of gates and, and preparations implemented in some real device. And the conventional approach is to construct effective gates acting on small subsystems, characterize the noise on individual gates, stitch the individual noise models together, and then use quantum error correction and hope everything works. And the problem is that these two statements don't make any sense because individual gates don't have a well-defined noise model because it depends on what else you're doing to the system. So you can't stitch together things that don't exist. So in particular, you need to characterize gates as they're implemented. And one of the, the big concerns that I have is that when people are doing characterization techniques and they're using things in specific contexts with very nice, neat scheduling, they get an error rate and then they essentially say, okay, that error rate now predicts the performance under some generic circuit where I've done hand-coded optimizations to scheduling to try and get as much performance as I can. And those are actually completely different error models. So you need to characterize your gates as they're implemented. And just to back this up with some data, um, so let's look at an example based on crosstalk at IBM Q. This is not to pick on IBM. Everyone has this problem and a lot of people are not aware of how bad it is. But if you look at crosstalk, it introduces significant gate-dependent coherent errors that depend on what gates you do at the same time on other qubits. And here, I've just realized I should have flipped the axis. Uh, here on the, the uh, here's a plot. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the um, 
labels for qubits. And on the y-axis, we have the ratio between the error rate when you're just doing a gate on that single system to the error rate when you're doing a gate on a single system plus other gates in parallel. And this is just the error rate acting on the local Hilbert space, so it's not even the full story. But even with this smaller story, you find that adding in extra gates, so a, in the, most of the data points here are around the 70 to 80% mark, which means you're essentially getting 30% additional error on a qubit by doing something on a different qubit. That's per qubit. Uh, and then some of the worst ones are fact, uh, 50%, so that means factor of two. And then the very worst ones are around 0.1, so that means an order of magnitude additional error depending on what you're doing on other gates. And the single qubit gates, just as a an em point of emphasis, these are actually much better than the two qubit gates. So this problem is actually significantly worse when you have two qubit gates. <clears throat> so then, if you want to have a well-defined model to have a hope of characterizing it, it needs to be well-defined, which means that you need to consistently implement your gates. And one way to do that is to talk about uh, parallel gates with fixed relative timings, which I call cycles, others call layers. It's the same kind of concept. But if you're doing it consistently, then there is a well-defined noise map that takes now n qubit unitaries to, to super operators, noisy channels. And your calibration should optimize that noise map. Everything should really be done with respect to that noise map. Um, this has actually been done in practice, even for up to nine qubits, resulting in an order of magnitude reduction on the overall error um, on a whole quantum register. Um, in 2017, the data was actually taken. And if you want to do error correction and mitigation, um, then it should be done with respect to this actual noise map. Um, you need to, and from Ken's talk, we know that actually taking account of the faults, the specific noise model will do, uh, give you a big gain when you talk about whether your system is fault tolerant or not. And here's a sort of subtle one that I think to me is obvious, to experimentalists is obvious, to theorists is not necessarily obvious. I have a map from unitaries to super operators. That looks like a map from things isomorphic to states to super operators. And so the natural quantum information thing to do is go assume the map is linear. That is a horrible assumption because this noise map is not a linear function of targets because you recalibrate. Um, so you can't use a lot of the, the techniques that you would like to use. One nice thing is that under fairly general assumptions, we can reduce this noise map to ideal gates composed with Pauli noise by using randomized compiling. But the big challenge is to learn this noise map specifically for large systems. If we can't learn it for, you know, we can learn it exhaustively for small systems, but we can't do anything interesting with small systems. And if we don't learn it for, um, and we know that we need to, And we're back. Okay, so we want to learn the noise map for large systems. Essentially, if we can't learn it for large systems, there's no point trying to build a quantum computer. And just to kind of put this into a flowchart of what I'm in, the way I intend to sort of, the way I see people trying to characterize and bring large scale quantum computers online, which I think is an incredibly important issue that a lot of people haven't think, thought about. Uh, the first thing is you're doing characterization of few qubit gates, so tune-up routines, randomized benchmarking, gate set tomography, everything we know works well, under the assumption that you have a close to independent noise, even though we know it's going to be bad. Basically because you need to get somewhere close to the right parameter space, um, otherwise your search landscape is going to be horrible. Then you do think, uh, randomized compiling to give you um, I give you a pa effective Pauli noise channel, and then we want to reconstruct the residual noise, which we can then try and compensate and correct. 
uh, either using sort of new um, calibration routines or doing things like error mitigation or um, fault tolerance schemes based on the actual noise we have. So now just to give some preliminary details of his the, the, the sort of outline, just some quick notation. Um, just P, I'm going to take the Pauli group and look at the commutant and the anti-commutant of the Pauli group. So the set of things that commute with um, of commutant and anti-commutant of subgroups of the Pauli group, everything will be based on that. And for every Pauli, just recall that if I look at whether something commutes or anti-commutes with a fixed Pauli, that defines a character of the Pauli group. And then one of the fundamentals in characterization is this idea of a Pauli twirl. If I apply a ran random Pauli channel, apply my fixed channel of interest and then invert and average over all random Paulis, that produces something that is equivalent to a stochastic Pauli channel. Um, and these coefficients, the Krauss operator coefficients, are effective Pauli rates. And these are the things we're going to learn. Uh, and then for any channel, just to make it actually work, we, this, is, this is not directly learnable. We can't just directly find these things out. There's no, no protocol that just says, tell me what's intrinsic in my device. I have to try and back it out from how it acts on something. And so, in particular, the, the way to, to do that is actually to note that if I plug in an input Pauli operator, then I get the same Pauli operator back, because when I conjugate a Pauli by itself, I get itself back up to a sign, and then I essentially get a sum of error rates, <coughs> pardon me, uh, in t uh, taking the inner product of the, this character function with the error rates. And then just definitions of stabilizer states, just quickly. Um, so the simplifying assumption, despite me telling you we have to really worry about the fact that this um, noise map is not linear, is I'm going to start by making an even crazier assumption, uh, which is well motivated in certain circumstances and can be relaxed with a lot of effort, um, which is to assume that the noise map is actually apply a fixed noise channel um, composed with a perfect implementation of the gate. So this is actually the, the standard assumption that was made for randomized benchmarking as up until about two years ago, um, basically because it's easy to analyze and we've worked out general ways of fixing this, but not for this work right now. Um, and then assuming that the, the noise is sufficiently nice, basically that it doesn't kill off any parts in Hilbert space too quickly, then we can learn the Pauli error rates to multiplicative precision, um, where the multiplicative precision is in, in terms of the so one minus the probability of uh, no error. And so if we want to learn everything, that's an exponential number of parameters. I'm only going to talk about sample complexity today. Um, then the, I get a two norm on the entire probability distribution. That's order epsilon one minus mu, uh, probability of no error. Um, with high probability and the sample complexity is one on epsilon squared n times 2 to the n. So this is actually quite nice. I'm learning 4 to the n parameters with 2 to the n experiments. Um, so it's a uh, speed up. You could call it an exponential speed up over the, the naive methods. And then if you want to look at a subset of errors which you can choose arbitrarily, they don't have to be a, a sparse description. So this is really quite important if you want to zoom in on a particular error that's troubling you. Um, then you can learn that to a, a max error because we don't have nice group properties. Um, that's order epsilon, one minus probability of no error. And the sample complexity is one on epsilon to the fourth times log of log squared s, where this epsilon to the fourth is really um, an artifact of, I guess you could say me being lazy, um, but it's also just a, a technical artifact of the proof in that we can't prove some certain uh, unbiased estimators nicely. And so we have to take a bad hit there. And then we can also learn an arbitrary field uh, with degree k correlation. So this cor essentially um, controls, this parameter k controls how far away qubits can be correlated. Um, and the accuracy here is now in the one norm, um, it's still multiplicative precision, and it's epsilon, one on epsilon squared times n squared log n where I'm suppressing a factor that's exponential in the degree k, so if you have really high range correlations, it's going to take a long time.
So the, how do we do this now? Kind of just a quick sketch of the, the methods. Um, so for a stabilizer group and a non-negative integer, we're going to prepare it. This is actually a very straight uh, generalization of randomized benchmarking and cycle benchmarking and character benchmarking and a whole host of other things that sound suspiciously similar because they are. Um, and we prepare a stabilizer state. We apply M plus one uniformly random parallels. We perform a syndrome measurement, record the outcome. And then we return the outcome uh, multiplied by all the parallels and then uh, quotiented with the, the group itself so we have to act with, um, so that we get something in the anti-commutator. And then we can prove that uh, under sufficiently well-behaved noise, the probability of any given outcome from one run of this algorithm will give a sum of exponentials. Just to illustrate what these are, in, we get a sum of the group, um, a constant here that's independent of M that has all the state preparation measurement errors, we get the character function, and we get the power fidelities raised to a power. Um, and you could fit this directly using a multi-exponential fit, but that's really hard. And it turns out that you don't have to because you've got this character here. And this allows us to multiplex and get uh, a lot of different um, power fidelities out from a single experiment, a single shot. Um, and basically, we, can, we need one on epsilon squared times the log of the number of fidelities we want to estimate um, to, get a, to get essentially high probability estimates of each of these individual terms without the character function. And the way we do that is basically we're going to multiply by the character and take expectation values and use character relations to show that this is unbiased. And lots of hoofding and union. And then once we can do these, we have a f to the m. That's a straightforward exponential decay. We can fit it in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and the easiest way for us is just to start doubling um, and stop when start doubling the value of m and stop when you've decreased your signal enough so that you can get a multiplicative precision estimate of your individual decay rates. And now we're sort of getting onto the sort of the kind of key problem is these decay parameters are not the things we want to know. Not really. They're the things we want to transform to know, which are these Pauli error rates, because they're actually what determines our mo noise model. And just to sort of re-emphasize, these things will often physically be approximately sparse, the Pauli errors. I don't expect to have a, a large number of Pauli errors. But even if these are sparse, these will not be sparse in general. All of them will be significantly different from one. So we don't, we want to essentially know these guys. And if we are using a group and exhaustively sampling everything, then we can just use the fact that these are characters. We have a character table. We can do an inversion. It's nice and easy because uh, the character is actually of a, a projective uh, abelian group. And that allows us to use unitary invariance to get it translate directly a bound on these to a bound on these. Um, and if we use a subset, well, then the additional one on epsilon squared factor is specifically because if I'm take, estimating um, these decay rates, there's actually no sort of rigorously known, or we, we didn't ha use a rigorous um, unbiased estimator, so we have to take an additional one on epsilon squared factor. Um, and so that's just an artifact. Um, now getting into some data, this actually works. Uh, it works on up to 14 qubits. It works even more. We just didn't have access to more than 14 qubits for it to work, and numerics only convinced the people who wrote them. Um, and essentially here we can look at data on, um, from IBM Melbourne. So they have 14 qubits active on this publicly accessible one. And here we have a covariance matrix where we've taken marginal probabilities of errors acting on single qubits. So this, this is the sort of natural thing you would want to know. I, do I have correlated errors? cropping up, and we find, for instance, that you get mostly, um, we've removed the diagonals because everything's correlated with itself, and we find that most of these white boxes, this is a Hinton diagram, and the size of the box in indicates the strength of the correlations, and most of them actually correspond, so if I take, let's say, this box here, apologies if I'm giving you a head spin, qubits 9 and 10, 
have these, these white diagonals. And if you look up the connectivity chip, they are right here. Then this makes sense that they're correlated because they're spatially adjacent. Now, if I look at something like qubit 3, it has a fairly wide band of being correlated with everything, which we don't really know why, but that's essentially what the data is showing. We can pick this out fairly quickly. We can also apply this to a variant with two qubit errors. Um, so here we actually have to change the protocol a little bit and the protocol's not as rigorously analyzed. But we actually start to see that if I group things into pairs, then I get a lot more correlations showing up depending on which CNOTs I'm driving. Uh, so in particular, if I'm driving, here I have a, the same qubits and the, the red arrows are the CNOTs that I'm actually applying. Um, so here, if I'm applying these specific sets that are particularly far apart, then the correlations, I get a, a couple that aren't very nice, but mostly they're, they're relatively small compared to the actual errors in the individual subsets. All of a sudden, though, if I start driving two that are close together here, then I start getting very, very large errors and large correlated errors showing up. It's essentially showing which pairs of CNOTs you're doing in parallel really makes a massive difference. So you need to be doing this effectively. Oh, did I run out? Okay. Um, and then we can also do this for, um, for ion traps and for all to all entangling. Um, Oh, that's the next slide. So if we look at the University of Innsbruck, they can load as many ions as they like. We have data for larger numbers of qubits, but I just ran out of um, essentially time. Uh, we didn't take the, the amount of data out. We wanted to get nice error bars um, for 10 qubits for error reconstructions. And so basically for, for four qubits, we took more data than we needed. Um, and you can see here on the y-axis is a probability of an error. The x-axis are different errors that can occur where I've grouped them by the weight of the error. So here, most of the errors are actually dominated by low weight errors, weight one errors, weight two errors are cropping up, some weight three and some weight four are cro cropping up with higher degrees of correlations than you'd expect. Um, and they're statistically significant, they're not dominant, but they are above the threshold that you would expect from independent errors. Now, when I add an all-to-all -all entangling gate in the middle, things go fun. Um, so in particular, I can, if this is now the error distribution of a round of random Paulis composed with a molmer sorensen all-to-all molmer sorensen gate. And I actually find that the additional errors are dominated by these high weight errors, uh, weights three and weight four. And here gets to some of the things where everything gets a little bit subtle um, because what we don't have yet is an understanding of exactly how to untangle where the errors occurred because where they occurred to, uh, indicate it relates essentially to the physics. Um, and we'll tell you what the actual underlying physical noise model is. And so in conclusion, we can accurately and efficiently learn an error noise model in the noisy implementation of Pali gates. The, the kind of proven rigorous accuracy is for that model only. Um, but we can, we know how to do the protocol for interleave gates and we know most of the steps to do more realistic noise. And what we want to do is essentially develop optimized fault tolerant quantum error correcting schemes using actual empirical data to, to motivate these decoders and schemes. And just acknowledging funding and because I'm running out of time, just want to mention that there's lots of open positions. Contact me or Steve if you're looking for a job because there are lots of jobs. So for that one, essentially the, the way we're doing the protocol, it's, uh, I think it had 20 for four qubits, but we're using that to essentially back out this precision. Um, is that why you were asking? Oh, yes. So what I specifically, oh, so the question was how many rounds of Molmer Sorensen gates there were in, the, in this slide here. And the answer is that it's 20. 
but the, the other answer is that in some ways the question, that question is really only relevant to the precision, not to the spread. So it's not the errors spreading between adjacent rounds that's the issue, it's the errors spreading from just in that isolated block that's the issue. That's what we don't know really how to analyze. <laughs>